Welcome viewers, I am Mamta, PhD Psychology. Continuing chapter 1 of class 12th, we will be covering three topics today. Variations of intelligence including mentally challenged, gifted people and the nature of different kinds of psychological tests. Let us start with the first topic, mentally challenged. Now, a lot of people uh, have a stigma towards uh, people with low intelligence be it mentally challenged or be it children or people with borderline intelligence. Now, they are perfectly normal people. The only aspect is that their intelligence level or their intelligence capacity is low as compared to other people of the population. So, they cannot do a certain kinds of task, but they are otherwise very normal. And this is biological, they are born with it. No amount of medication, no amount of surgery can reverse the damage of the brain structure and the neurons or the nerve cells. So, let us look at the characteristics of children or people who are mentally challenged. We in fact use this term mentally challenged, not mentally retarded because retarded also at attaches a negative image to these people. Now, American Association of Mental Deficiency, AAMD gave this definition of mental retardation as significantly sub average general intellectual functioning. Now, here we have the first component of sub average intelligence functioning, which basically means their IQ is below 70. That is the first component existing concurrently with deficits in adaptive behavior. Deficits in adaptive behavior is a second component which means their ability to adjust and cope up with different situations is comparatively much lesser than other people. For instance, tying shoelaces or taking care of their own self, eating food at times gets difficult, time concept, money concept, all these are adaptive behaviors. Third, manifested during developmental years, basically means below 18. Obviously, such children are not able to do very well with education or schooling. So, they are not able to pass themselves. So, it is identified before 18 years of age. It basically means a child of a certain age, let us say a child of 5 years is not able to grow as per his chronological age. His mental age is lesser as compared to the chronological age. So, a child who is having an age of 18 years might be having a mental age of a child of 7 years that is mentally challenged. Let us look at the four categories. Mild category has an IQ normally between 50 to 55 to 70 IQ. 85 percent of the population has uh, of uh, basically mentally challenged has this problem. Now, this we call as educable category because such children can be promoted till class 6. They are able to pass themselves till class 6. Therefore, they are educable category and these are still better of the other three categories that we are going to study. They can still manage, they can still marry, they can still have children, they can still learn vocational skills and have their careers under supervision of course. Second category is the moderate category. 35 to 40 to 50 to 55 is the range of IQ here. 10 percent of people suffering from mentally challenged are having this problem. Now, these uh, children are not able to promote themselves after class second and these we call as trainable. We can train them under supervision, with support, with guidance, with constant uh, help they can still manage. The last two categories are re really debilitating categories because severe and profound, although we have IQ from 2025 and then last one is 2025 below up till 0, that is no intelligence at all. Now, uh, severe and profound find it really difficult to manage. Profound rather, they are mostly bedridden. It's like a vegetable, they cannot really do anything, they cannot speak, their speech is retarded, their emotions are not really existent, their self-care is not there. So, they face a lot of problem and they do not survive very long. That is about the variations of mentally challenged. We move on uh, to the other extreme of intelligence which is giftedness. Now, we have already talked about people having low intelligence. On the other hand, we have people who are gifted, who are having extremely high level of IQ. Let us look at their features. 
they have exceptional general ability. So, general ability here refers to intelligence, global intelligence, total aggregate of intelligence shown in superior performance in a variety of areas. Now, they are identified again because they have a good performance in excellent and superior performance, unique and exceptional ability in all areas, in all kinds of tasks. So, therefore, it is very easy to identify them as well. From the teacher's point of view, it depends upon a combination of high ability, high creativity and high commitment. So, this is A C square, the short form for helping you remember. High ability, of course, we know general ability is very high. Creativity, of course, is very high with these people and commitment, they are self-motivated. Such people, they take the initiative, they work themselves, they read up a lot, a lot of books, they try and they have a very good memory, they have a very good observation ability, analytical ability. In fact, Lewis Terman did a research where he followed up 1500 children and he tried to understand were they able to succeed in later life. Children who had high IQ, who were gifted, having an IQ above 130, they were followed up and their occupational success was seen and it was found that they were very successful with their careers. Let us look at the characteristics. They have advanced logical thinking, questioning and problem solving. Of course, you cannot refute their logic very easily. Their logic is very, very good in quality. Superior generalization and discrimination, their relating power, their abstraction, their ability to distinguish and differentiate between various phenomena is very, very high. The kind of question they will ask, you will be looking for answers. The kind of words they will use will be exceptional again. The kind of products they will develop will be very good. The kind of ideas they have, exceptional again. Third, high motivation and high self-esteem. Now, a lot of times, such children, when they are sitting in a normal class, uh, the problem that they face is when a teacher gives a problem, they are able to sort it out very, very fast as compared to the other children who are average. Now, this particular child then gets bored sitting in the class and he does not know what to do. So, he utilizes his energies in disturbing other children. So, this is where they can even become school dropouts. Fourth, independent and non-conformist thinking. Now, such children obviously are uh, the kinds who do not really listen to others' viewpoint because they know they are clear. They have a very clear thinking, very clear thought process and obviously they do not believe in following rules. So, they do not confirm to what other people are confirming because they think different. Now, a lot of times giftedness have been differentiated from talent and prodigies. Now, you might have heard of a child who has been able to remember the whole of Oxford Dictionary. Now, that is something which is a talent, a specific memory. A child who is exceptionally talented in a particular area, that is talent. But giftedness is overall capacity in all kinds of tasks. So, remarkable ability in specific field, they are highly talented, which we also call as prodigies. Let us look at the last topic, which is the various kinds of intelligence test. Now, we have three kinds of classifications here. First classification talks about the procedure of administration. So, when I am giving a test to a particular individual, that is an individual based test. Obviously, that is going to take a lot of time and effort. And that test requires individual attention because instructions have to be explained steps have to be explained, the procedure has to be followed step by step. So, that is the advantage of an individual test. A group test obviously gives you a greater data. You can just give common instructions and administer the test to the group of let us say 200 individuals and if they have a problem, they can obviously ask, but that data is obviously large and you are able to address and collect data for a larger number of people with common instructions. Now, the examples of these two tests, uh, one is Stanford Binet test, which was an individual test and you had to give it age wise, you had to give it in different categories, so it took a lot of time. Group test, which is uh, more than one individual, Army Alpha is an example of an uh, a group test. Now, uh, second is the nature. That is the language, the nature of the test depending on the language criteria. If I am using a verbal test, something like this, this has language based. A child who knows language 
can only understand this, nobody else can. A test developed in US and used in Africa obviously cannot be understood. That is a verbal test. Stanford Binet was a verbal test. Nonverbal test where we are using symbols and pictures. Now, this test is an example of a nonverbal test where you have symbols and pictures, you have to fit it in in the particular completion of the picture. That is a nonverbal test. Performance test is where you're using your muscles and manipulating and various blocks, let's say. That's example is Bhatia battery of performance. Last category is the culture. Now here we talk about culture free, culture fair and culture biased. Now initially there was a term used culture free. There's no such term as culture free because no test can be free of culture's influence. Yes, we can definitely minimize the influence of culture, but we cannot completely eliminate it. So for that, we now have culture fair test. Most of the non-verbal and performance tests are free, relatively free of the influence of culture. Culture means the language, culture means the thoughts, the symbols. It's relatively free of the influence of culture because of course language is not there. Culture bias test, when we have a test developed in a particular cultural setting, and used only for that setting. For instance, uh, I ask you, how many stars are there in the flag of USA? Now here, obviously you cannot answer because in India you're not following that pattern. It's a very culturally biased test in that case. When we have to use it in a different culture, we modify the test, that is we adapt the test items and we follow the scores based on the setting in which we are using it. Culture fair test, the example that I just showed it to you is an example of a culture fair test. Most of the non-verbal and performance tests are meant for this. Culture biased, any language based test or any test developed for a particular culture is this. So to summarize what we did today, we covered three major topics. First we talked about variations of intelligence and in variations we covered two extremes of intelligence. We talked about mentally challenged people, which we earlier used to call as mental retardation. We tried to understand the three criteria for identifying mentally retarded or mentally challenged. This was the definition given by AAMD. We moved on to the four categories of mentally challenged based on IQ. And along with that, we try to understand what are the abilities they have, what qualities they have, what behavioral patterns they have, what can they do and where do they need help. Then we moved on to the other extreme, which is giftedness. Now, such people have a very high exceptional general mental ability. These are people who are having high IQ above 130, exceptionally bright, and very good in all the areas, very good memory, very good capacity. We talked about how to identify such children, their behavioral patterns, their characteristics, and trying to understand how they can be helped in a normal classroom setting. Then we moved on to the nature of intelligence tests. We have three categories under it. We try to talk about the category first based on the procedure of administration, the way a test is administered either to a group or to an individual. Then we moved on to the nature, uh, the second categorization based on the language or the nature of the test. We talked about the verbal criteria based on oral or written language. We talked about the criteria of nonverbal which of course can be done by people who cannot speak and people who cannot read or write. Then we talked about performance test based on objects and their manipulations. Last was the cultural category where we talked about the culture fair and the culture bias test. That's about it for today. Thank you.